Good Sunday morning to you. This is Pastor Jones here at Valley Assembly of God right here in Hagerstown, Maryland, welcoming you to our Sunday morning worship service. And uh, I pray that you brought your Bible in hand or you have it open in front of you and that you're going to follow along in God's word this morning. And I pray that God's going to use us to be a blessing and encouragement and a help to you. Take your Bibles, if you would, with me to John, the seventh chapter. John, the seventh chapter. Now, we, the last couple of weeks, we talked about Abraham's four altars. And then we talked about elements of prayer. And uh, to build an altar, uh, to be a person of prayer, there is one thing that's absolutely necessary, and the word is thirst. You have to thirst after God. And that's our subject today. And I pray that uh, the Lord's going to use me somehow, some way, to create a greater thirst in you for the things of God. Sometimes we get sidetracked by the world. Vance Abner said it. We're snacking too much at the counters, the lunch counters of the world, that we've lost our appetite for the things of God. But this morning... I pray that God is going to create a brand new thirst in you for the things of the Lord. My text this morning is John, the 7th chapter, the 37th verse, Jesus is speaking. It said, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing on your word, on your messenger this morning. And Father, I pray your blessing on this subject, the subject of thirst. Father, I pray create within every one of us, no matter where we are in God, a greater thirst for you, a hungering, a panting after you like we've never known before. And I pray, Lord, let your word come alive and may you anoint your messenger now, we pray. We thank you for it. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, there was a commercial that you see frequently on TV talking about this is the thirsty generation. And if I remember rightly, it was an advertisement for Coca-Cola. And uh, it probably was on the screen in the middle of the summer hoping that you were real thirsty and you'd run to the refrigerator or run to the store and get yourself a bottle of Coke to drink. Commercials know how to tap into the needs of individual lives. Create within you a thirst for something maybe you didn't think you had a thirst for. But what I'm talking about this morning is so much more than that. We live in a generation that has forsaken the fountain of living waters and has hewed out broken cisterns that cannot hold no water, Jeremiah 2 and 13. In other words, instead of thirsting after God and thirsting after the eternal things of God that really slaked your thirst, We've run after every gimmick and gadget and thing that society can bring to light, and we run after it, we thirst after it, only to find out that at the end of the day, our thirst has not been slated. We're still thirsting, and nothing in this world has satisfied us. Our Lord declared that whosoever should drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Man, what an enormous statement. If you drink this living water provided for us by the Lord Jesus Christ, you will finally come to the place that you will never thirst again. Jesus really satisfies. On the cross, Jesus cried, I thirst. Just as he was forsaken of God that we might never be forsaken, so he thirsted hanging on that cross so that you and I might never thirst again. 
He paid the penalty of sin. And consequently has provided us a living water that really, really satisfies. He invites us to come and drink. That invitation is for everybody. Nobody's excluded. Boy, girl, teenager, young adult, middle-ager, senior citizen, I don't care the color of your skin. I don't care about your nationality. I don't care about how money you, much money you make or don't make. Doesn't matter what neighborhood you live in. Doesn't matter what's in your wardrobe. His invitation to you this morning is to come, and not just come, but to come and drink. And what is the consequences or the results of that coming and drinking? The consequence is that you will receive and you'll find yourself believing. You'll receive and you'll believe. And then, thirdly, to appropriate for our need is all sufficiency. Did you know that in Jesus... Every need of which you and I have is met. Every need, no matter what it is. Physical, marital, financial, mental. He's here to meet your need today if you will come and drink. If you'll come and partake in appropriate what God has had, has made provision for you in your own individual heart and life. Only, listen to me now. Only he can satisfy. Have you not run to enough places? Have you not waited deep enough in sin to know by now that nothing of which you've tried really satisfies? You know why? Because only he satisfies. And if we do not drink of that living water, the only alternative for us is found in Luke 16 when we see that man who dies and goes to hell. And there in the midst of the flames of hell, lifting up his eyes in torment, asked that Lazarus might come and just drop a drop of water on his tongue to quench his thirst, his parched tongue. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to end up in hell. I don't want to end up separated from God. But that's the only two paths you can take. So my appeal, my cry to you this morning is, is to thirst after the things of God. The last invitation in the Bible says this in Revelations 22 and 17. Let him that is a thirst come. Are you thirsty? Come on. Drink to the Lord Jesus Christ. You shouldn't have to be strong, darn. You shouldn't have to be coaxed. You know you're thirsty. Come on to the one that can slake that thirst once and for all. Blessed are we if we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, for we shall be filled. But you have to hunger and you have to thirst to bring you to that place where you will find real satisfaction in God. The gracious invitation of our text might be summed up in a number of ways that I want to point out to you today. First of all, thirsting. How, how might we describe that thirsting? That thirsting is so great it's like a man that nothing but a glass of water will slake his thirst. He's literally dying for that drink. That's the kind of thirst we're talking about. It's like the woman at the well who met up with Jesus. Who had all that she had, all the marriages she went through, the one that she was living with at that point in time was not her husband. Her slate, her thirst had not been slated. But in her interaction with Jesus Christ, Jesus brought to her the living water. So excited by that impact with Christ. She ran back into town and said, come and see the man who's told me all things about my life. 
Because she drank of the living water, God instantaneously used her in a soul-winning endeavor because the whole town came out to hear what Jesus had to say. Do you know that we're the salt? That's what Jesus calls us. And if we're the salt, our family, our neighbors, our friends, the people we work with, we ought to be creating within them a thirsting for the things of God. Please don't enter into this world and be like them. Don't talk like them. Don't joke like them. Don't run with them. But be the salt that God has intended you to be to create a thirst in them for God. When was the last time that God used you to influence somebody to come to a saving knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ? So we have a thirsting. And then we have a coming. Like Nicodemus, at night, was choiring of Jesus about being born again. Now here was a man that was well-to-do. Here was a man that was a learned man. He was a teacher. He was teaching others. And yet he himself had not come to grips with the born-again experience. How must I be born again? Jesus kind of chastised him. How is it that you're a teacher and you don't know these things? Jesus said, I tell you again, ye must be born again. But you know, for Nicodemus to learn that, to be brought to a place of coming to know Jesus really as Lord and Savior, he had to come. There was a thirst in his soul that brought him to Jesus in, at nightfall to ask the question that brought him into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care how learned you are. I don't care how rich you are. If you are not walking with Jesus, there is a thirst that you cannot slake. There's a hunger that you cannot satisfy. They can only be met in Jesus Christ. So we have the thirsting and the coming. And then, of course, we have the drinking. Like the disciples did, turning from their rough, hardened fishermen ways to real men of God. Think about those men. Now, they weren't all fishermen. Luke was a doctor. Matthew was a tax collector. But all of them came from lives that walked in the trenches of life apart from God. Rough saw, tough guys, smart guys. But every one of them in need of a genuine relationship with the Savior. If they were going to partake, they had to drink. A real transformation, whether it be in your life or mine or anyone's life, will never happen Unless you thirst, you come, and you drink. What's the old saying? You can bring a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. You can get somebody to come to church, and there can be a wonderful move of God as we worship, and a wonderful move of God as the preacher preaches the word of God. But unless you drink, unless you wade in and reach out and get a hold of God, you leave the same way you came not benefited in the least bit. May you drink this morning. Drink deeply of the things of God. And leave here with a, a genuine transformation this morning by the power of God in your life. So we've got a thirsting, we've got a coming, we've got a drinking. And then we have a believing. Like the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. Went to every doctor in town, spent every dime she had, but instead of growing better, she grew worse. But then she heard of Jesus. And when Jesus came close, she made her way through the crowd, threaded her way through the crowd, and 
maybe in one last ditch effort with every bit of strength she could muster up within her. Falling to the ground, reaching out in desperation, she touched the hem of his garment. She believed that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she could be made whole. Instantly, she was healed and made whole by the power of God that flowed into her. The man who came to the disciples of Jesus while the Lord was on the Mount of Transfiguration was a demon-possessed boy, and they could do him no good. When Jesus came down, the father brought the boy to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Sir, can you believe? And with real tears and anguish, he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Because he reached out in genuine belief, Jesus cast the demons out. The boy was made whole. How about those four men that brought that cripple to Jesus but couldn't get in the door because the house was full? And they went on the roof and tore up the roof and lowered the man down on his cot right in front of Jesus. You know what that demonstrated? That demonstrated a genuine believing that if somehow, some way, this man could come in contact with Jesus, he could be made whole. And guess what? He was made whole. And he was made whole not just because of his own individual believing, but because there was four men that bore the weight of that man in the cot, lowered him down to the roof of that house. And they believed that Jesus could make them whole. And Jesus made them whole. How's your believing level today? Have you really taken God at his word? Do you trust him with all your heart? Do you believe him? So we've got thirsting, coming, drinking, believing, and then we come to the last one. Overflowing. Like the disciples on the day of Pentecost. They waited 10 days. They prayed. They conducted business. They fellowshiped. They waited. Then all of a sudden there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind and tongues of cloven fire. And it fell upon the 120 in the upper room. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. You know what that speaking in other tongues is all about? It was all about them overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Boy, do we need an overflowing in our hearts and lives today. And some of you under the sound of my voice needs a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Evidence by speaking in other tongues. Overflowing with this living water. The woman at the well brings the whole town out to see Jesus because she was overflowing with the presence of the Lord. The one leper out of ten who received his healing. The others went back to their businesses. They went back to their homes. They went back to, their, to whatever. But the one man could not return home. He had to go back and thank Jesus. Jesus had touched him. Jesus had healed him. There was something bubbling within that man. There was an overflow of gratitude and thanksgiving. He had to demonstrate it. So he comes back to give thanks for his healing. And that man was not only physically healed, but he was made whole by the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something this morning. Is your experience in God overflowing to others round about you? Are you a positive influence? Are you pointing people to Jesus? Do they genuinely see something in you that they cannot find in others who do not know Christ? Oh God, this morning, may he grant to every one of us a thirsting after the things of God that brings about this thirsting that I've talked about, the coming, the drinking, the believing, and the overflow that will have a definite impact upon those round about us. We must be conscious, friends, of our need. Deeply conscious because thirsty is not just a casual wanting of water. It's I need a drink of water or I'm going to die. We must come to the source. The only one who can satisfy our thirst is Jesus. 
There are broken cisterns of plenty, and how many poor souls stop there and never go any farther? We must drink, receive by faith, and then believe that we've received. Then we shall overflow to the glory of God and to the blessing of other people. Isaiah 55 and 1 says this. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Let every one of us come this morning and drink deeply of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so position ourselves to be a blessing to everybody around us and to impact them for Christ. Let me ask you something this morning. How long has it been since you sincerely thirsted after God. Bow your heads with me, would you? Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that everyone under the sound of my voice has hearkened to this preacher today. And I pray, God, that if it's not been there, that you'll create right now in Jesus' name a thirsting for you like we've not known for a very long time. A thirsting, God, that will put something into motion that will cause us to run after you and to serve you like we've not done for a long time. Lord, there's somebody in the sound of my voice this morning that has not invited Jesus into their heart and life. I pray this morning that something this preacher has said has spurned within them a desire for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they run to you today and open their hearts to our Father, I pray, find entrance into their heart and life. Forgive them of their sins and help them, I pray, from this day forward to live for you. Now, Lord, as another week is dawning, I pray this week will be evidenced by a thirsting and a hunger for you like we've not known in a long time. And, Father, I pray it will be evident to everyone we come in contact with and that, Lord, you'll use us to make a difference, I pray. Keep us safe. God, and direct our steps. And, Lord, we give you the glory for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you once again for joining with us today. Have a great weekend, God, and we're going to see you soon. God bless.